Good to see you this morning, church family, and I'm going to do my best. I've got a couple waters up here just because we've got some allergy junk running through our house, and so if I have to pause and take a sip, I just apologize ahead of time. I don't like doing that, but just out of curiosity this morning, how many of you, your favorite season of the year is fall? Do we have any fall folks? Okay, just a few. I love the fall. It is far and away my favorite season of the year. Uh, We don't get much of true fall, but I love fall things. Uh, There's a lot of reasons for that, but but, uh, I love this time of year. I love to go out in the morning like this morning, and you go for a run, and there is a coolness in the breeze. It brings back sweet and vivid memories of Whenever it would be, most of the time it would be late October when it would happen, but whenever you would be out there in football practice and all of a sudden that first cool breeze of fall came rolling through, it it transformed everything. I love the fall. And for all the things that I love about fall, it is also wild that it is in the fall every year, and, and, and especially every few years when we have the most intense stressors regularly as a country in the form of elections. So I love fall, and at the same time, we understand that this fall will be a consequential fall in the life of our country and the reality of what's going on in the world. In fact, few parts of our country can you look and find people who are not stressed about the consequences of what will happen in November because of the consequences of how it will impact all of the things that we are watching take place throughout our world, which are happening so quickly, all of which are so dangerous. Now, I give you that today. Today's sermon has nothing to do with the election. But I need you to understand and to feel and to think with me how intense it feels in our culture and world surrounding the consequences of what will or will not take place with the election. Because what Paul has been walking us through in Ephesians, dealing with Jesus and the church, and by the church really we mean the local church, The serious consequences of that are far greater and should therefore be more gripping than any of the consequences we might feel towards what is or is not happening in our world. And so I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, but before we pick up in chapter 4, I want you to look at just a couple verses, put a couple things in order for us to really make sure we get the magnitude of what what we see in chapter 4 today. So go with me to Ephesians, and we're going to look in chapter 1, Ephesians 1, verse 9, and we've seen this before. Ephesians 1, 9, Paul is praising the Lord, and part of his prayer of praise, he says this, God made known to us in all wisdom and insight, God made known to us the mystery of His will. There was something that God is doing that was once hidden from us, but now those of us in Christ, it's no longer hidden, we know it. And and this is in accordance to the kind intention. So God in His kindness, He wants us to know this, He, He wants us to see, and this is what it is, verse 10, with a view to an administration suitable for the fullness of times that God is working to put a plan, to put a, a reign in place, and here's what it is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, that what God is actively at work doing, what He has been at work doing what He is at work doing, and what He is going to finish off is this work of summing up all things in Christ. Now that term, I'll remind us, that term summing up, uh, it, it carries with it the, the idea of renewal, that, that Jesus is renewing and recreating, that there is something renewing that Jesus is doing. Jesus, in taking all things in heaven and on earth, is taking all the brokenness, and He is bringing a renewal to it. But it's not only that. The idea of summing is also the idea of of headship. 
that Jesus is the head of all things. He is the one who created all things. He's the one who sustains all things. All things were made by him and for him and are due him. And, and what it means that he is summing up is the rule and reign of Christ. Jesus is taking all of the broken mess of this world and he is going and he is working to bring it all back into proper alignment under his rule. Now, I say proper alignment because for those who are righteous in Christ, that proper alignment will be a joyful eternity of bliss. For those who have rejected Christ and stand in their own righteousness, that proper alignment will be to bear the full justice of their decisions. But what is God doing? He is summing up, He is bringing all things into their proper place in Christ, both in heaven and on earth, in the unseen realm where the angels and demons uh, live and move and breathe, and in the seen realm where you and I live and move and breathe. Now, summing up all things in Christ, then look further down with me. Chapter 1, verse 21 says that, that, or verse 20 says, God raised Jesus from the dead. He's seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, that this position of honor and power, this seat of rule is far above it, all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, that God has put all things in subjection under his feet, and God gave Jesus as the head over all things to the church which is the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It says that God, he raised Jesus from the dead. He has set Jesus on the seat of power and authority that is above all the powers of darkness that bring destruction and havoc in our world today. It's far, far above them. And all things have been placed under subjection under his feet. Put it this way, all things, all the things that keep you and I awake at night are bugs under the feet of Jesus easily squashed. And it says that Jesus is the head of the church, His body. It makes that statement, who fills all in all. What is Jesus doing? That Jesus is actively at work as, as, as God is working to bring all things back under proper alignment to Jesus, that Jesus is working to fill all pockets of creation with His reign. And it says this here, that that filling is through the church. That the church experiences the fullness of Jesus in a unique way, and that the church is used by Jesus to bring that filling into the world. Now flip with me to chapter two. Chapter two, let's remember this. In chapter two, Paul reminds us that we are, verse 19, no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. This household has been built, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, would be the written scriptures with a cornerstone, the key, the keystone that holds it all up, Jesus Christ, the one who it's all about. And it says, in whom, in Jesus, the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Here's what it's saying, that Jesus is actively at work in, in His church, universal, global, but, but in each and every local church that is truly yielded to His Lordship, that, that Jesus is actively at work growing and forming us. We already are His temple, but He is making us a more perfect, more holy temple. And by the way, the word temple there is not just the idea of the temple building, it's the idea of the holy of holies, the dwelling place of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that what God is doing in the local church, where is God dwelling on earth right now? Now, on one hand, if you're a systematic theologian, you go, well, God is omnipresent. He is in all places. Yes, but, but specifically, where has God delighted to place the fullness of His presence such that if you live on this earth, you should be able to go, I see God living, moving, and breathing? It's through His church. It's through His church. Okay, now, move forward with me, chapter 3. Chapter 3, Paul will come back, and in verse 8, he says to me, the least of all saints, this grace, this ministry was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God 
who created all things. So Paul's back to talking about the mystery. We saw the mystery in chapter one. God is actively working in all things in history to bring everything in creation, seen and unseen, into right alignment under Jesus' rule. And here he says the mystery. Where does he go? What part of the mystery is this? He says, so that the manifold wisdom, the beautifully complex wisdom of God that no one can fathom might now be made known to the rulers and authorities, to all the powers of darkness, that the, the wisdom of God might be made known how? Through the church. And then when you get just a few verses later, now to him who is able to do abundantly far more beyond all that we ask or imagine according to the power that is already working within us, to him be the glory in the church. So understand with me what Paul is saying. Paul is saying everything is about Jesus. And what God is doing, everything's always been about Jesus. It'll always be about Jesus, and God is working to bring that reality into alignment in creation. Creation which was originally created rightfully aligned, but because of our sin as humankind, sin broke that right alignment, and now it's chaotic and broken and wicked and sinful and painful, and death reigns. but that God is working through Christ Jesus to bring renewal, to bring recreation, that for you and I as human beings, we may still live in this broken world, but if we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we will no longer perish but have everlasting life, and we are brought reconciled back into a right alignment, a right relationship with God. And those of us collectively who are brought into that alignment were called the church, and here's what it says. It's all about Jesus. But the chosen team that God chose to put on the floor to point everybody to Jesus is the church. Now catch that. It means that the church shows the world who God is. It means the church is able to live out what humanity cannot live out. The original, the original commandments God gave for humankind to live out and to bring his goodness into the world. Humankind apart from Christ cannot do it but the church can. Now catch that. It's not America or Great Britain or Indonesia or Russia or China or the Byzantine Empire or the Roman Empire. Come up with, it's not, that's not where, that's not the key team God put on the floor to bring all the glory, it's the church, which goes beyond all those borders. Now, how is this church going to be effective in doing all this? Well, look what he says then. Therefore, chapter 4, we looked at this last week. I implore you to walk worthy of the, I mean, in the manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Live out who you actually are in Christ. He says you're, you're going to live out with the characteristics of humility and gentleness, with patience, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, diligent, zealous, earnest, eager to preserve the unity of the Spirit. And we watch that this unity is a big deal to God because there's one body. God only creates one church. There's not multiple different kinds of churches. There's, I mean, there are multiple churches, local, but we mean that a church is either in right alignment with God or they're not. There's only one body of Christ. There's only one Holy Spirit who regenerates and fills and seals. There's only one calling, one hope of the calling. There's only one Lord, one Jesus, <clears throat> one true faith, one right doctrine, one baptism, one means of salvation, one God and Father who is over all and in all and through all. That unity is such a serious reality that Paul, after three chapters of telling us who we are in Christ because of the goodness of greatness of God, he says, here's what God is doing. It's all about Jesus, and God is working through the church to bring that message to all of creation. And as a church, as a local church, to operate rightly, it demands we fight to preserve the unity which the Holy Spirit's already given. It's not that we find a way to unify ourselves. The Holy Spirit's already given the unity. It's that we fight to preserve that unity. 
Unity is vital for us as a church to actually be able to take the floor and to play the game in the way that points it all to Jesus. Now, how does this unity play out? Now, look with me in verse 7. But to each one of us, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, to each one of us implies that we are to be unified as one, but each one implies we are many individuals. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, when it says grace there, uh, the term is not being used in the same way as we talk about uh, the grace that saves us. When he says that to each one grace was given, it's talking about that there was a grace like Paul uses in chapter 3. Paul views his ministry that God gave him and called him to, and Paul views the gifts and talents that God has given him to do that ministry. He calls it a gift of grace. That's what this is. It says that each one of us in the body of Christ, Jesus has given as a gift of His grace a ministry and a means to do the ministry. That, that this unity is intended to flow out of a, sovereign, a sovereignly given and created diversity. That God has fashioned and given grace in, in, in ministry and the, in the means to do it to different individuals, fitting a unique place and out of this diversity because we're not all just alike each other, but we are all bound by one Lord, by one Spirit, by one God and Father, unity. That there is to be unity which flows out of this diversity. Now, we're going to jump for a second over verses 8 through 10, but we're not skipping. We're coming back. It says, but to each one of us, the grace was given according to measure of Christ's gift. And get specific about some of these gifts. And Jesus gave some as the apostles, and some as the prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as the pastors and teachers. Here's where he says first, he says, in these gifts that Jesus has given to the church, that Jesus himself has given certain individuals a specific office to fill, the purpose of that office, we'll see in a moment, is for the good of the church. He describes, uh, depending on how you want to define it, four to five. The apostles, that would primarily refer to, to the 11 disciples and Paul plus James, the brothers, a few others, the, these specific eyewitnesses that were sovereignly sanctioned by Jesus who, who either wrote by their own hand or, or it was their testimony that we get the New Testament from, who serve as the foundation, the founda foundational scriptures, the foundation upon which our faith rests, Jesus being the cornerstone, the prophets, Certainly can reference the Old Testament, the prophets. We've seen that usage earlier. In addition, we know that there is a such thing in the New Testament as a gift of prophecy, and it's not about telling the future, but it clearly is a discernment and an ability to take the Word of God and correctly apply it in certain situations. There are those in the church who've been gifted with the gift of prophecy. It says the evangelist. Now, the evangelist is not, well, God gave some people to share the gospel and the rest of us, if we're not that, are off the hook. That's not what the evangelists are. The term, really, the better way to understand that term would be somebody that God has called and gifted to go out into new or hard places and be the pioneer planning the church, doing that initial work of evangelism, a church planner especially a church planter in a, in a hard or unreached place, an international church planter. And then it says pastors and teachers. Now, some of your Bibles will split. Some will say maybe pastors who teach because different than these other terms, when you get to these two terms, there's only one article in the Greek, which would imply there is, there is a connection there. Pastors literally are shepherds. Shepherds. Shepherding is 
Massive in the Old Testament, the priests failed to shepherd Israel rightly. God says He will raise up new shepherds. These new shepherds will be in the vein of Jesus, the great shepherd. Shepherding, that's what that term pastor means, that God raises up men to fill the role in the life of the local church as pastor. There's other terms in the New Testament, elder, overseer, bishop. The elders are exhorted in 1 Peter to shepherd, to pastor. So one of the gifts that God gives the church is He raises up and calls and qualifies and equips men to serve as pastors. And what is one of the core things a pastor is expected to do according to the qualifications? To teach the Word of God rightly. Pastors must teach. Now we do know there are some teachers who are not necessarily, they're not called, they weren't, they're not pastors, but they do teach. And, and God has raised up these roles these specific roles for a purpose. Well, what's that purpose? God has raised up these roles of leadership. God has given them as gifts. Why? Well, look at verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. For the equipping, for the preparing, for the working to bring someone to a place of completion that God has given these specific roles. Now catch this. It does not say God gave the apostles and the prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors, teachers, for the work of service. That's not how it reads. It says God gave these roles, these people God raised up and put in these roles. God did so for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Now, let me put this real bluntly and clear what, what he's saying. What he's saying is God has not fashioned his church such that me and the other vocational pastors are the ones who do all the ministry. We're the professionals. It's actually not that. Our job is to equip all of us because it is our job to go do the ministry. If our mindset of church is church is a place where I go and I get a spiritual TED talk and I get and I get and I get, we've missed it. Church is the place we come together. Uh, the church building is the place we come together. The church is really us. It's not a building. It's a family that lives and moves and breathes with one another, that encourages one another, that serves one another. Here's what this means, church family, the truth of this. We're one body with many members entrusted with varying gifts according to the grace of God. Church family, brothers and sisters, you are a minister. If you are in Christ, saved by grace through faith, God has called you to ministry. God has called you to do ministry. And a lot of times what we do in church life, I, I had a college student and I, I threw him under the bus one day and he wasn't prepared for it. And I threw him under the bus, really what I did is I praised him. We had a college student, his name's Charles Wallace, one of the most godly college students ever to have come through the ministry. And Charles, Charles loved Jesus. Charles was actively growing. Charles was like a spark plug in a room. Charles was discipling people. Charles was sharing the gospel. And I know how most of the time it works. People see this in, in the church. Oh, Charles, man, you really love Jesus. Maybe God's called you to full-time pastoral ministry. As if only pastors should really love Jesus. Shouldn't we all really love Jesus? And I threw that out because here's what you need to know about Charles. God had not called him and given him as a gift to the church to be a pastor. He was studying to be like a physicist in electrical engineering and talking about things that for all the Greek and Hebrew I know, I can't understand at all. And you better believe we need people who really love Jesus who are high-ranking electrical engineers who have proper functioning minds to be able to understand the data and put it to use for your and I's good. You have a ministry. And when I say you're called to ministry, I'm not implying that everyone in here is called to be a pastor teacher. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God has called you, church family, to a minister. And the job of my primary responsibility and the pastors is to equip all of us to go do it. The work of service, as broad as ministry could be, to go out and to serve, to, 
It's a love, that, that work of service. What is it ultimately? Well, look what it says, to the building up of the body of Christ. God, at the moment of salvation, has called you to a ministry. God has given you, when it says grace, here's the, here's the amazing thing when it says God has given grace, back in verse seven, it means that everything you need from God to fulfill the ministry he's purposed your life for, you have access to. Because his grace is sufficient. And that ministry at its core, it is to build up the body of Christ. Well, what does building up the body of Christ look like? What do we, well, certainly that implies seeing the body grow, lost men and women get saved. Listen, I cannot do all the evangelism of our church. We must do all the evangelism of this church. There are lost people, men and women, in our classes, if you're a student, in our workplaces in our retirement communities, in our neighborhoods. And God has called each one of us to a ministry to reach them. That's part of the church being built up. It's growing. But it's not just growing in that way. It's, it's growing in depth and greater Christ-likeness. Look what it says to the building up of the body. Well, how long does this go on? How long are you called to do ministry to the building up of the body? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the son, knowledge of the Son of God. Until we all arrive at a point where our doctrine, our understanding of the truth of God, it is unified, and it's not just unified in terms of we all agree, but it's unified because we all arrive at maturity where, 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 where our doctrine's correct. And that doctrine is primarily focused and pointed to Jesus, the knowledge of Jesus, that there would be, we would be unified in our, in our faith, and we would be unified in our experience of and love for Jesus Christ. This is one way, building up of the body. To what point? To where we're unified in, in the doctrinal truths and we're unified in our knowledge of the Son of God. To a mature man, that rather than being a child, rather than being immature, rather than being stunted, we are to grow up into maturity. We'll see what that looks like more next week. Another way to picture it, what, what, is, what is a mature man? Mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Jesus that God has called us as a church to walk with each other, to relate to each other in humility, with gentleness, where we're driven not by what I get out of it, because it's not about me, it's about Him, and if it's about Him, He drives me to be about you. We walk in humility and gentleness. We suffer long with each other. We bear with one another, meaning we bear when someone's weak. We bear with one another when we're annoying each other. We bear with one another in love because we're driven to love each other. And in all of that spirit, we demonstrate ourselves zealous to preserve the, the unity that the Holy Spirit gives. A unity which only He can give. A unity which is reflected doctrinally. It means that unity is not unity at all costs. It means it's unified around that which is actually true according to the Word of God. A unity of purpose and mission. If it's the unity of the Holy Spirit, it's not only reflective of the Scriptures which the Holy Spirit wrote, it's also reflective of the Holy Spirit's heartbeat. And who does the Holy Spirit, the whole Holy Spirit's ministry in this world is to convict the world of sin and in the life of the believer, it's to what? It's to remind us and point us to Jesus which means that our unity, our harmony, our being of one accord by the Holy Spirit is a unity of purpose and mission and, and character. What should unity looked at, look like lived out? It, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It says that you and I prove zealous to preserve that unity which the Holy Spirit gives delightfully so, generously so. And that as we zealously prove for that unity, what it looks like played out is that we recognize that if I have been saved by grace through faith, and if God has placed me to be a member of this local church, First Baptist Pflugerville, then, then I, I, I actively recognize that God has called me to do ministry. And so I make sure that I get equipped and I go out and serve, and here's the reality, and I'm not knocking uh, elsewhere, we might use the term spiritual gifts. 
And I'm not knocking spiritual gift tests. But the purpose of this today is not to say, all right, well, so just don't do anything until you figure out exactly what your gifts are. There were no spiritual gift tests in the early church. In fact, you want to understand if, 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 if what the grace God gives is a spiritual gift, you want to know what the purpose of a spiritual gift in your life is, it's not for you. It's for you to use for others in the body, to build the body up, to encourage the body. And you want to know the best way to figure out what your spiritual gift is? It's not to take a test, it's to go serve. So go serve. How do we live out this unity? We do it serving. We do it functioning correctly where I and the other pastors are focused on equipping all of us as the saints. By the way, I'm a saint too, even though I'm a pastor, which means there's ministry I'm accountable to do. I'm not only equipping. Our job is to equip that we would go do the work of the ministry. And that work of the ministry is the building up of the body. It is to grow the church into maturity, maturity which looks like Jesus. Put this way. We look like Jesus because we think and believe like Jesus, right doctrine? We look like Jesus because we're living like Jesus, filled with the fullness of Christ. And here's what this means, church family. It means true maturity. True spiritual maturity cannot be found in your life or mine apart from the local church. You cannot be mature in Christ if you cut yourself off from the local church, which means we got to be present. And I don't mean you got to be present at every single event the church body offers. But I do mean when it's time to worship, when it's time to care for one another. Here's the reality. Prior to COVID, the average church member, not church attender, church member, prior to COVID, the average church member went to church less than two times a month. We wonder why our churches are so immature. It's because we do not value being together. Maturity cannot be found apart from the local church, which means we got to be present. It also means we got to get prepped. It's not just being present. It's to set yourself in places where you can be equipped. This is why we're always driving. The whole reason I'm I'm teaching two sessions of equipping you this afternoon. Why? Because we got to be equipped. What are we doing? Wednesday night Bible study. What's the focus of Sunday morning? It's to equip, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You've got to be present. You've got to be prepared. And here's the reality, church family. Maturity cannot be found apart from the faithful service of the gifts God's given you. God has made you in Christ Jesus artistic master craftsmanship. God has created you in Christ Jesus for good works He prepared beforehand that you should walk in Him. God has made you quite literally to serve, brothers and sisters. And the service is not about you. Listen, here's the reality. There is more ministry to be done amongst ourselves than what five of us can keep up. There's more ministry to be done in our community, which is growing rapidly and not slowing down, even though the world's going crazy. There is more ministry to be done than even what our church could handle. I remember at College Station, the other college pastors, we, we did not view each other as rivals. Oh, your college ministry is bigger than mine, you're reaching more. One, that's not biblical in any way. If there is another God-glorifying church, they are not our rivals. They are our brothers and sisters. They are our partners that actually we're to walk in unity with as we reach our city. But it occurred to us one day, there's 86,000 college students in Bryan College Station. Easily 10 good, solid churches they could go to. We figured on the best day, there's maybe 10,000 students that are, that are believers, and that's, that's, that's a high, high ceiling. It's probably less than that. We said, what if revival just struck out and half the student population of Bryan College Station came to faith in Christ? That'd be 40,000 new believers. Do you know what that would mean practically to each of those 10 churches? Overnight, we would have 4,000 baby believers we'd have to find a way to disciple. You know, see, here's the reality, church family. There is more ministry to be done than even we have capacity for. Our job is to be faithful to employ the gifts God has given us to do the ministry He's called us to do. Now, earlier I told you, I love fall. There's a lot of reasons I love fall. Part of why I love fall is is, um, fall is always nostalgic for a lot of things I grew up with. Grew up and 
played football throughout junior high and high school and genuinely loved playing and was given a very good, we, we were, we were a, a good team. Many of us played both ways. We had coaches who pushed us hard but loved us and were godly. And so the fall, it does remind me of some of those memories, which in turn mean I do things that maybe aren't the wisest, like watch Remember the Titans, which some of you cry at chick flicks. I will cry and remember the Titans because it stirs up all these memories. If you're not familiar with Remember the Titans, it's the story of T.C. Williams' high school football team in Alexandria, Virginia in the early 70s. And in the movie, they have integrated all the high schools, and, and there are severe racial tensions, and they take the players to start the season up to camp at Gettysburg College. And the tensions between the players are, are just driving a wedge such that the team will never be able to be what it should be. And, and one morning it boils over, and the horns go off at four in the morning. And in the scene, Denzel Washington playing Coach Boone, he tells all the players, get behind me single file, we're going for a run, and they just run. And they run and they run, and, and finally they arrive at a field as the sun is beginning to come up and the morning dew is evaporating into a mist hovering above the ground. You can kind of see through that mist there's tombstone after tombstone. bringing the team out there. They're all tired and winded. Here's what he says. Anybody know what this place is? This is Gettysburg. This is the field where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg. 50,000 men died right here on this field fighting the same fight we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here was painted red, bubbling with the blood of young boys, smoke and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their souls, men. Killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen and take a lesson from the dead. And then here's what he says to the team. If we do not come together right now on this hallowed ground, we too will be destroyed just like they were. Church family, we are living in a broken and painful world. It is filled with sickness and fatigue. Weekends where we attend funerals for loved ones and get phone calls about other loved ones who are missing and fear dead and natural disasters. We live in a world where war is on the brink, and when war comes this next time, it will not be a war like anything mankind has ever known. In church family, you and I need to understand today the solution for this world will never be found in the halls of any building of government. And I'm not diminishing the importance of government. But you and I need to understand God is at work bringing all things into right alignment with Jesus through His church. And the enemy hates with all the vitriol of his malice the unity of the church. He will disunify the church doctrinally. Isn't it interesting that when you see churches move in, in doctrinally unfaithful positions and move into progressive and false theology, you rarely hear of church splits or moral failures. But when you look at churches that have right doctrine, you'll find pastors with moral failures that, failures that do damage to the church, and you'll find people fighting over what color the carpet is and where the water, mach the water machine should go, and whether it's pews or chairs or this or that, or whether I got this room or my seat. See, here's the reality, church family. God has called us to walk in unity. It is a unity which is brought about through the diversity of the body He has brought together to be, quite literally for us, First Baptist Church, Pflugerville. A unity which demands each one of us take up the ministry He's called us to. A ministry which grows the body into maturity. And if you or I are quiet for a moment, we can hear brothers and sisters long past who've allowed lesser things to fragment and disunify the unity of the Holy Spirit in the body. And if we could hear their cries as they see the glory of the risen Jesus, we would hear them beckon us. Walk in the unity of the Holy Spirit with humility and gentleness, bearing with one another in love, zealous to preserve the unity of 
the Holy Spirit, because as Christ prayed, Lord, I pray that they may know. I pray that they would be one with each other and with us, that the world would know they're yours. The world is watching, church family. May we be a church who chooses zealously to come together in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you. You are worthy. You're worthy. Lord, the church family is a wonderful thing. And it should be a place where each and every one of us are ministered to and encouraged and built up. But it does not exist primarily for my needs. It exists for your glory. And the way your glory is revealed through the church is through the unity, Holy Spirit, that you give. And that unity is intended to be grown and spread through the diverse and faithful service of each member of the body. Jesus, I just pray today, you know where each one of our hearts are. You know what you've called each one of us to. May we clearly hear your calling. And may we trust that your grace is enough and may we step out to do the service you've called us to do. Jesus, if there's any in this place or online that do not know you, there is no grace of ministry because they have not known your saving grace. Then may today be the day, Holy Spirit, they, they yield to your conviction. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, and to you we look.